Okay, so welcome everyone to this um, to this webinar, which uh, we hold uh, in order to replace the previous one, which had to be cancelled. Um, and I'm very happy to see um, that uh, that uh, many of you returned to this uh, to this one. Uh, and we will listen to Dr. Maria Victoria Mateos, who will speak about um, the um, or give an overview of uh, the most important data. Uh, from uh, the, the field of multiple myeloma with special regard to the to the ash conference um, in in san diego and um, well you take it away dr mateos and i'm really looking forward to what you've got to tell us okay thank you and good afternoon everyone and first so, so thanks uh, to the myeloma patients in europe for giving me the opportunity to be here with you today sharing an overview of recent data and updates from us in multiple myeloma and as thomas mentioned ash meeting took place in san diego in december next slide you can see here like at last american society of hematology meeting so almost 1000 abstracts based on multiple myeloma was submitted to this Congress. In fact, the massive number of oral and posters were based on CAR T cells, many important novel updates, and uh, well, we had the opportunity to listen a new late breaking abstract in which so we are going to have the opportunity to see how a new standard of care for newly diagnosed myeloma patients non eligible for autologous assistance transplantation will be submitted very soon to be approved by the authorities around the world. Next slide. First, I will do just uh, so an introduction about the general concepts, and uh, we will discuss later on uh, the novel data we have coming from newly diagnosed myeloma patients, and uh, the last part of the presentation will be focused on relapsed and refractory myeloma patients before to having some minutes for discussion with you. Next slide. Next slide. General concepts. So myeloma, maybe you have heard many times that myeloma remains today as an incurable disease. And I decided to start with this slide that was not basically presented at us, but recently published in Blood Cancer Journal. And it's an international myeloma working group analysis in which you can see here like uh, approximately 15% of myeloma patients can be potentially cured. Next slide, if we wanted to try to identify the patients potentially uh, curable with multiple myeloma, you can see like the age, the thrombocytes level, the novel agents based induction, the maintenance therapy, but very important, the achievement of complete response after the total assistance transplantation. In other words, the quality of the response is becoming an important surrogate market predicting progression-free survival, but also overall survival and at the end, long-term survivors. Next slide. Let's move on now to focus on newly diagnosed myeloma patients. And in the next slide, you can see here the standard approach for the management of a newly diagnosed myeloma patient transplant eligible. And transplant eligible, you know that it means usually patients younger than 65 or even younger than 70, if the comorbidities are not present and if the, good, if the performance status is good. And the general approach includes, according to the ESMO as well as NCSN guidelines, induction, transplant, and maintenance. What about the next slide, induction? You have to know that in terms of induction before autologous stencil transplantation, all patients should receive it today a three drug based combination. And during this last meeting, we had the opportunity to see an update about bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, VRD, that so you have to know that this combination will be approved by FDA and also in Europe maybe very soon. When we evaluated the outcome of this combination, VRD, in young newly diagnosed myeloma patients, the median progression of survival is of approximately 50 months with a median overall survival that has not been reached yet 
in patients younger than 65. But in addition to this study, the Spanish myeloma group evaluated also the role of bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone in a series of almost 500 newly diagnosed myeloma patients and compared in this integrated analysis presented at ASH meeting with the VTD, bortezomib, thalidomide, and dexamethasone. Next slide. Briefly, you can see like VRD, bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone is slightly superior to bortezomib, thalidomide, and dexamethasone. In terms of BGPR rate or better, post-induction as well as post-transplant, most importantly, the proportion of patients achieving undetectable minimal residual disease after induction and transplant are also slightly higher in comparison with VTD. But you have also to know that the main advantage of VRD versus VTD is derived from the toxicity profile because the use of lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone induced a very low rate of peripheral neuropathy. That, as you probably know, is the main adverse event related with the administration of thalidomide. So, in conclusion, these results are further supported by the use of bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone as the control arm in many ongoing randomized controlled clinical trials. Next slide. New combinations about induction regime. RDD is going to be the new standard of care, but during us meeting, we had the opportunity to see new combinations that are coming. Next slide. The first one is to replace bortezomib by carfilzomib. And carfilzomib, in combination with cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone, followed by transplant and consolidation with carfilzomib, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone, was compared with carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, followed or not by autologous stem cell transplantation. The next slide, the main, the main message from this presentation is that after induction, after four cycles of induction, Carfilzomib in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone is superior to carfilzomib, cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone. And in the next slide, when we evaluate the overall response rate, the VGPR rate or better, as well as the minimal residual disease negative rate that you can see in blue, carfilzomib, lenalidomide and dexamethasone is always superior to carfilzomib, cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone. We have to wait to have a long-term follow-up in order to see the final outcome of these patients, because in fact, in this study, you can see here, like a subgroup of patients received the KRD transplant followed by KRD, and a subgroup of patients received just KRD 12 cycles without autologous stem cell transplantation. And the overall response rate was similar. So we have to wait to know how the outcomes of this patient are, and uh, we will have these results in the upcoming Congress. But uh, KRD can be in the future another new standard of care to be used as induction, maybe before autologous stem cell transplantation. In the next slide, another possible combination that we will have in the future are fields bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone plus the monoclonal antibody daratumumab. So this combination has been just evaluated in a small series of patients, only 16. But in the next slide, you can see like this combination is safe for the patients and the addition of daratumumab to VRD does not result in any safety signal. And in the next slide, you can see like a preliminary overall response rate as well as complete response rate is promising and as well as the minimal residual disease negative rate that reached 50 percent at the end of consolidation. Another combination in the next slide also evaluated in a small series of patients is bortezomib, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone plus daratumumab. And again, I would give you the same message. So this combination will be maybe a new standard of care in the future because in the next slide, you can see like from the safety point of view, there are not a major, major concerns. And in the next slide, when we evaluate the efficacy, you can see here like after four induction cycles, the overall response rate is of approximately 80% with a significant proportion of patients achieving VDPR rate or better. 
In the next slide, you can see preliminary progression of survival and overall survival data, but just, I am not going um, to focus. On just, just one second. Am I on the right slide now, or is this the next one that you that you want that you are uh, talking about? Well, this one. I I am going to I am talking about right now in the Kumar slide, exasomibl and alidomide and dexamethasone. Do you see the slide? Dara plus exasomibl and alidomide and dexamethasone in newly diagnosed myeloma patients phase two study. I'm trying to find this. Well, I can say which uh, is the slide number 24. Okay. Slide number 24. Here we are. Yes. Yeah. Okay, this is just another example of a new combination that maybe can represent a new standard of care. Ixasomib, as you know, is a proteasome inhibitor of oral administration and was in this study combined with lenalidomide and dexamethasone in combination with the CD30H monoclonal antibody, daratumumab. Only 30H patients. Next slide. You can see here like this combination is effective and in fact so the best response rate was almost 100%, meaning that almost all patients responded with approximately 20% of the incomplete response. You have to know that all these studies I am showing you right now are preliminary studies conducted in small cities of patients, but they can be the rational for moving towards large phase three randomized trials, resulting at the end in new combinations, new standard of cars to be used in the upfront setting. Next slide. You can see here again this general approach for the management of myeloma in the transplant candidate newly diagnosed patient induction. And we have just reviewed the, the induction, transplant, followed by maintenance. What is the role of autologous stem cell transplantation after induction with the novel agents based combinations? In the next slide, you can see the outcome reported by the Spanish myeloma group in a study conducted more than 10 years ago. And why this study is important? Because patients were included in this study and received in blue, as you can see, bortezomib, thalidomide, and dexamethasone more than 10 years ago. And we can see here, like now, approximately 25% of the patients remain alive and free of progression. One out of four patients included in this study receiving VTD remain without progression. And when we evaluate the overall survival, more than 50% of the patients remain alive after 10 years of follow up. And these results have been confirmed also by the Italian myeloma group. And this uh, so show a clear message that I would like to share with you. The survival of patients with multiple myeloma is significantly improving. In the next slide, you can see here a meta-analysis presented by Michele Cavo from Bologna in Italy, putting together data from patients included in three large European studies. In all these studies, patients received induction with bortezomib, thalidomide, and dexamethasone, and approximately half of the patients received single autologous stem cell transplantation, and half of the patients received double autologous stem cell transplantation. In the next slide, the message is that, well, Tandem autologous stem cell transplantation, so double autologous stem cell transplantation is better than single transplant in the intent to treat patient population, in the overall population. But what is important to note, and this is a clear message to put in practice, is that the patients with high risk cytogenetic abnormalities or patients with high risk features benefit the most from a double autologous stem cell transplantation. And this is what physicians in Europe are mostly doing in their clinical practice. Tandem autologous stem cell transplantation for patients with high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. The next slide, following the general approach for the treatment of young newly diagnosed myeloma patients, 
what about the maintenance? And in the next slide, you can see like at ASH meeting, a new trial was presented evaluating Ixazomib, the oral proteasome inhibitor, as part of maintenance therapy and compared in this case with placebo. You have to know that Ixazomib was given in this trial only during two years and this study met its primary endpoint. And the use of Ixazomib resulted into a significant benefit in terms of progression for survival versus placebo. And in fact, the tolerability of Ixazomib as maintenance is excellent because the frequency of hematological and non-hematological adverse events were really very low. So maybe Ixazomib can be potentially used as maintenance in the future if this drug is approved by the authorities. You have to know that although the study met its primary endpoint, it's true that the benefit so is not very evident, and in fact, the use of Ixazomib resulted in a median progression for survival of approximately 27 months versus 21 months for patients in the placebo arm. In which situation we can potentially select Ixazomib to be used as maintenance versus lenalidomide, that as you know, is the standard of care to be used as maintenance? Maybe in patients in which lenalidomide can't be given due to poor tolerance, or maybe in patients with high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities, in which we know that the role of proteasome inhibitor is important. And the next step maybe is to combine Ixazomib in combination with lenalidomide, especially in patients with high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities. The next slide, you can see here a summary of what we have heard at ASH meeting regarding the newly diagnosed myeloma patients transplant eligible. VRD as induction, the new standard of care, novel combos KRD, and maybe this three-drug-based combination plus daratumumab transplant, and concerning maintenance, LEN as a standard of care, lenalidomide, and exasomib as the new oral proteasome inhibitor. Anything new? In the next slide, you can see here like the CAR T cells that, as I previously said, many oral presentations were based on CAR T cells. And one of these presentations was based on the use of CAR T cells in the upfront setting. Only 10 patients in a Chinese center with high risk that these 10 patients received a CAR T targeting CD19 and BCMA after autologous stem cell transplantation. In the next slide, you can see if we focus on the last column, the latest response in purple, you can see how 50% of patients achieved a stringent complete response, 20% complete response, 30% VGPR. And in fact, at the bottom of the slide, we can see how 60% of patients achieved undetectable minimal residual disease. This is just something very preliminary, but of course very promising. And maybe we have to move towards the use of these new immunotherapy strategies like CAR T cell, maybe in the upfront setting, but in patients with high risk. Next slide. Let's now briefly to evaluate the latest news presented at ASH meeting, but based on the transplant in eligible patient. And well, we have right now two new possibilities that were presented and updated at ASH meeting. The first one is based on a VMP, VMP plus daratumumab. This combination was presented one year ago and published in New England Journal of Medicine. And in fact, VMP plus daratumumab, you probably know that uh, was approved by both FDA and European Medicine Agency. And during this ASH meeting, we had the opportunity to see an update. In the next slide, you can see the design of the Alcyon study in which VMP was compared with VMP plus daratumumab, nine cycles followed by daratumumab maintenance single agent. In the next slide, baseline characteristics of the patients that I am not going to focus on that. In the next slide, disease characteristics again, I am not going to focus. 
Next slide. This slide is important, and you can see the progression of free survival updated. The median follow up now is 28 months, and you can see like there is a big difference between data VMP versus VMP. And in fact, so the addition of data to MUMAB to VMP resulted into a significant benefit in terms of progression free survival. In the next slide, you can see like the progression free survival benefit was observed across the different subgroup of patients. And in the next slide, you can see like the addition of data to MUMAB to bortezomib, melphalan, and prednisone resulted in an overall response rate of 91%. This means, for your information, that almost all elderly newly diagnosed myeloma patients who received data plus VMP respond and are able to achieve at least partial response. But what is much more relevant is that approximately half of them, 45% of them, achieved complete response. And in the next slide, you can see how, in addition, approximately one third of the patients, 27%, achieved minimal residual disease negative. And when we evaluate how the progression free survival is when patients achieve the minimal residual disease negative, you can see like there is a big difference and the progression free survival is much more longer. In the next slide, you can see here the evaluation of a surrogate marker for overall survival. This is progression free survival two. And in the next slide, you can see the progression free survival curve that it is representing the curve that we will see when the overall survival data are mature. And you can see here, like, there is already a significant benefit in terms of progression free survival, too. And the benefit in overall survival will be present, but we need longer follow up. In the next slide, important data, safety profile. Safety profile for the patients is, I would say, the first. And when we continue with the data to MUMAB single agent beyond the cycle number nine, you can see here like the frequency of grade three, four adverse event is really very, very low. And no more than two or three patients developed respiratory infections, back pain, or influenza indicating that the tolerability of daratumumab in this case in combination with VMP is very good. In the next slide, so you can see here again the general slide in which so we are going to evaluate another new combination that we can potentially use in the elderly population, Lendex plus bortezomib or Lendex plus daratumumab. Lendex plus daratumumab has been maybe the most important abstract presented at ASH meeting. And in fact, this was presented in the late breaking abstract session. So a special session in which so the scientific committee select the six most relevant abstracts presented at the Congress. In this study, the nalidomide and dexamethasone was compared with daratumumab lenalidomide and dexamethasone again in the elderly population. In the next slide, you can see the baseline demographic and clinical characteristics. And I am not going to focus on the baseline characteristics. In the next slide, patient disposition, but I think that it's not relevant for your information. But in the next slide, the treatment exposure is not relevant for you. But in the next slide, you can see the progression free survival. And this is important because of the median follow up is 28 months. And again, you can see here like the addition of data to MUMAB to lenalidomide and dexamethasone resulted into a significant benefit in terms of progression free survival. And in fact, the control arm, you have to know that it was very good because lenalidomide and dexamethasone as continuous therapy resulted in a median progression free survival of 32 months. But when we add daratumumab, the benefit is much more evident. In the next slide, progression free survival benefit across the different subgroup of patients. In the next slide, again, the overall response rate and the overall response rate, complete response rate, and minimal residual disease negative rate are similar to that previously reported for data plus VMP. 
93% of overall response rate, 48% of complete response rate, and 24% of minimal residual disease negative rate. So these results are very good results. And in the next slide, you can see how patients who achieved minimal residual disease negative have a significant benefit in terms of progression to survival. In the next slide, the overall survival for preliminary data, but again, we can see a trend to see a benefit in terms of overall survival for the three combination, for the three drug-based combination, daratumumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. In the next slide, safety profile, acceptable, with no many hematological or non-hematological adverse events, and a safety profile consistent with the safety profile I previously said for DARA plus BMP in the Alcyon study. In the next slide, we can see here again the trial in which bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone was compared with lenalidomide and dexamethasone alone. And in this situation and in this study, in the next slide, we are going to focus on the elderly population, older than 65 or even older than 75. And this combination can represent also a new standard of care for the elderly population because the median progression free survival is approximately three years and the overall survival is over five years. So VRD represents also a potential standard of care for this combination. In the next slide, I think that you can see here the three new standards of care for newly diagnosed myeloma patients non eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation. DARA VMP, DARA lenalidomide and dexamethasone, and bortezomib lenalidomide and dexamethasone. FDA and European Medicine Agency have approved only DARA VMP, but the other two regimes will be approved in the upcoming months, maybe before the end of this year. In the next slide, just to mention that other combinations that we can potentially have for this patient population and were presented during ASH meeting. Lenalidomide and dexamethasone as continuous therapy. So maybe you know that this is a concept. Lenalidomide and dexamethasone is usually given to our patients as continuous therapy. And lenalidomide is... Um, hold on, doctor, yes. I just want just one second. Is this the slide which says management of multiple myeloma in the non-transplant candidate? No, uh, next slide. No, the it's next, next slide. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I was saying that lenalidomide and dexamethasone is usually given to our patients as continuous therapy. And lenalidomide is usually given at a dose of 25 milligrams 20 days, followed by one week rest, in combination with dexamethasone 40 or 20 milligrams weekly. However, in this study, what the Italian myeloma group did was to compare this conventional standard of care with Lendex induction nine cycles, full doses, followed by lenalidomide single agent at low dose, only 10 milligrams without the dexamethasone. Why this study is very important from the patient point of view? Because dexamethasone as continuous therapy can influence in the quality of life of the patients and can result into the development of significant hematological and non-hematological adverse events. So in the next slide, we can see how when we did when we give to our patients Lendex followed by lenalidomide as continuous therapy, the outcome of the patient is better. But why the outcome is better? Because the toxicity profile is better and the incidence of adverse event is inferior. So from the practical point of view, maybe all physicians treating elderly patients with myeloma after an induction with a Lendex full dose, it is possible to eliminate dexamethasone and to continue with the lenalidomide at a reduced dose. We are going to have the same benefit in terms of overall response rate, complete response rate, progression free survival, but we are going to significantly improve the tolerability, what is relevant for the elderly population. 
In the next slide, so I am going to show you briefly new combinations. Ixasomib, daratumumab, and dexamethasone, the oral proteasome inhibitor plus the monoclonal antibody. And this combination was evaluated in a specific population and fit and frail patients. In the next slide, just preliminary results because the number of patients is very small, only 20 patients, but while well, this combination was effective and especially was safe with a few patients discontinuing the trial due to toxicity. In the next slide, another possibility is to combine bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. I previously said that this is going to be a new standard of care for this combination, plus isatuximab. And you have to know isatuximab because it's another CD30H monoclonal antibody, like daratumumab. But daratumumab is already approved, and isatuximab is not yet approved. But in the next slide, you can see how, how the addition of this monoclonal antibody isatuximab to RVD is effective in this elderly population with a significant proportion of patients achieving at least VGPR, and in fact, a significant proportion of patients achieved, in fact, a minimal residual disease negative. So these results are very positive. And in the next slide, as 2018, and let's go to focus now on relapse and on refractory myeloma patients. And in the next slide, you can see here four cardinal points that all physicians have to consider when we have in front of us a relapse and non-refractory myeloma patients. And we have to evaluate the type of relapse, the efficacy of previous therapies, the toxicity, the further options. And of course, we have also to include the patient's preferences, the convenience of administration, and why not the cost. And in the next slide, you can see the ESMO guidelines 2017, published a couple of years ago. And this is the guidelines that most physicians in Europe are following right now in order to rescue our patients with multiple myeloma. In the next slide is again the same slide in a different format, just to mention something important that you have to know. The treatment given as part of the first line of therapy is clearly to influence the treatment that we are going to select at the moment of relapse. And this is becoming something very important. We have to try to give always the best the first, but the first line of therapy is going to influence the second line of therapy. In the next slide, you can see how patients treated with bortezomib-based combinations in the first line, exposed or not to lenalidomide, but no progressing under lenalidomide therapy. So patients non-refractory to lenalidomide, at the moment of first relapse, these patients are usually rescued by carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, daratumumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. And it's true that it is possible also to use ixazomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, or ilotuzumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. During this uh, as Congress, in the next slide, we had the opportunity to see the update of the combination based on daratumumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. And at relapse, it is very important to note that the median progression free survival was 44.5 months. This median progression free survival is the longest one reported in the relapse setting in a phase three clinical trial. And in the next slide, we can see how if we add daratumumab to lenalidomide and dexamethasone in the relapse setting, the overall response rate is 93% and the complete response rate 57% with 30% of minimal residual disease negative. In the next slide, well, the outcome for patients receiving daratumumab lendex in first relapse and the outcome is better as well as if the patients achieve the complete response, the progression free survival is much more longer, and there is a benefit in terms of progression free survival too, that I previously said that this is a surrogate marker for overall survival. 
In the next slide, you can see the benefit of uh, data in combination with Lendex for patients with high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. And uh, this combination is effective in this population and uh, can represent an option for patients with high risk feature. In the next slide, you can see here the evaluation of sustained minimal residual disease. This is, uh, and maybe you have to know that this is a new response criteria published a couple of years ago by the International Myeloma Working Group. Sustained minimal residual disease negativity means that uh, we evaluated today the minimal residual disease as is negative. And we evaluated the MRD again one year later. And if the minimal residual disease is negative again, we can say that this patient is in sustained minimal residual disease negative. And when we evaluate how the outcome is for these patients with sustained minimal residual disease negative, you can see like the progression free survival curve is a flat because 100% of patients remain alive and free of progression. And this has been evaluated in the Pollux study con receiving lenalidomide dexamedasone plus daratumumab. In the next slide, we can see another possibility. Patients treated in the first line of therapy with bortezomib-based combination and exposed to lenalidomide and progressing under lenalidomide therapy. So these patients would be, I would say, lenalidomide refractory. How are we going to rescue to these patients? In the next slide, we are going to see how the combinations that we usually select for this, for this population are carfilzomib and dexamethasone or daratumumab in combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone. And we can select one or another based on patient's preferences, patient's characteristics, as well as disease characteristics. In the next slide, during this as meeting, I had the opportunity to present the update of the use of data VD in patients receiving this combination in first relapse. And when this patient received the data VD at first relapse, the median progression of survival was 27 months. And this efficacy was maintained in spite of prior therapy with either bortezomib or lenalidomide, what is important. And in the next slide, you can see this curve, data VD after bortezomib and after lenalidomide. And in the next slide, similar efficacy results. We select the use of carfilzomib and dexamethasone as part of the first relapse. In the next slide, you can see the outcome of data bortezomib and dexamethasone in patients with high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities that it's good and it is possible to use this combination. In the next slide, again, the evaluation of the sustained minimal residual disease negativity after data bortezomib and dexamethasone, and this is also an excellent surrogate marker for progression free survival, as well as also overall survival. In the next slide, so this is, uh, you can see in uh, gray, different, box, different boxes with uh, new combinations, new combinations that uh, are going to be used more and more in first relapses. During this as Congress, we had the opportunity to see efficacy and safety results uh, from some of these combinations, but you have to know that most of them were phase one, two clinical trials. So the results are not mature yet, and we need to have the results of phase three randomized clinical trials. In the next slide, this is a busy slide that I am not going to focus on that, but in the next slide, this is a comparison also about the lenalidomal refractory patients. Let's go to move to the next slide. And uh, well, this is just uh, to summarize that uh, maybe today for patients refractory to lenalidomide, as I previously said, we have to rescue these patients with carfilzomib dexamethasone or bortezomib dexamethasone plus daratumumab. But uh, in the near future, new options are coming, and these combinations will be pomalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone pomalidomide, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone, pomalidomide, dexamethasone, daratumumab, 
pomalidomide dexamethasone plus carfilzomib or maybe carfilzomib dexamethasone plus daratumumab. And what about subsequent relapses? So patients in third line and beyond, do we have new agents to rescue these patients? The answer is yes. In the next slide, you can see in the bottom how new agents, POMDEX plus something else, monoclonal antibodies and novel agents are going to be evaluated in this specific population. In the next slide, you can see again isatuximab as monotherapy, the CD38 monoclonal antibody similar to daratumumab. And in the next slide, you can see an important message also from the practical point of view. When the monoclonal antibody is combined with dexamethasone, the overall response rate and the progression for survival duplicated in comparison with the use of the monoclonal antibody as a single agent. So in the clinical practice, maybe if we decided to use the monoclonal antibody as a single agent, a good option is to add the dexamethasone because we are not going to increase the toxicity and we are going to increase the efficacy. In the next slide, you can see here melflufen. Melflufen is a novel targeted alkylating peptide. You have heard about melphalan, but melflufen is not like melphalan. It's a new alkylator with different properties and it is much more selective just for the myeloma cells, inducing myeloma direct cytotoxicity, avoiding of target effects. Melflufen, in the next slide, was evaluated in a series of heavily protreated myeloma patients, all of them refractory to daratumumab and refractory to pomalidomide. And in this situation, the combination is effective, the combination is also safe, and there are many clinical trials currently ongoing evaluating the role of melflufen in different settings of patients with multiple myeloma. In the next slide, you can see selinexor. Selinexor is also a novel agent that will be maybe very soon approved by our authorities and was evaluated in combination with dexamethasone in penta refractory myeloma patients. So patients that have been previously exposed to all conventional regimes. And in the next slide, we can see here like this combination is effective in terms of overall response rate, progression free survival and overall survival with a good safety profile Selinexor has to be in all has to be always combined with dexamethasone in order to ameliorate some gastrointestinal toxicity, but it is uh, acceptable. And uh, I repeat that this combination will be approved soon by our authorities. And Selinexor in the next slide has been also combined with the daratumumab and dexamethasone in relapsed and unrefractory myeloma patients. And in the next slide. You can see like this combination is effective and this is the message I would like to share with you. And Selinexor is going to be combined with bortezomibil and alidomide, pomalidomide and also with daratumumab. In the next slide, so let's go to focus in the, less, in the last five minutes of my presentation in the immune therapies. Immune therapy and you can see here in red passive immunotherapy and especially adoptive therapy and cell therapies or new monoclonal antibodies. And during the ASH meeting, in the next slide, we had the opportunity to see the preliminary results of a new agent that is AMG420 or 420. It's an anti-BCMA bite. This monoclonal antibody you can see here in this picture like it's a molecule that it is going to target the plasma cell because the plasma cell in the right part of the slide you can see like a bcma is expressed on the surface of the plasma cells what is the peculiarity of this specific type of monoclonal antibody that this monoclonal antibody in pink targets the bcma expressed on the surface of the plasma cells but this bite, this monoclonal antibody, bring with him the T lymphocyte. And you know that the T lymphocyte is the cells that are going to attack and to destroy and to engulf our myeloma cells. So it is not necessary 
that the T lymphocytes arrive to the bone marrow to destroy the plasma cells because these T cells are going to be engaged with the monoclonal antibody. So these uh, specific type of monoclonal antibodies are very attractive. And in the next slide, you can see here, like this was a phase one study, first in human. So this is a dose escalation study in which patients started to receive a very low dose of this monoclonal antibody. And the important message is that when we evaluate the overall response rate and the efficacy in patients who received the maximum tolerated dose that was 400 micrograms per day, in the next slide, we can see like these patients, and you can see here in the table, they are in complete response, partial response, complete response, minimal residual disease negative, minimal residual disease negative, so very encouraging efficacy results. We have to take care about the toxicity, from my point of view, especially infections, because uh, some severe infections were reported, but this is something completely new that maybe will be improved for sure. And while this new monoclonal antibody is going to be expanded and new clinical trials are going to be activated in many European centers. And in the next slide, we are going to see the results coming from ACARTI. So, in the last in the in the in the last slide you can see how there were two oral sessions in which uh, all presentations were based on CAR T cells but i decided to show you this because this is new this is a CAR T targeting again BCMA expressed on the surface of the plasma cells evaluated in china in an unique institution in 57 patients well this uh, patient population were relapsed and non-refractory myeloma patients, but you have to know that relapsed and non-refractory myeloma patients in China, and this means that these patients had been previously exposed to bortezomib and lenalidomide, but these patients have not been previously exposed to daratumumab, because in China, daratumumab is very expensive. It's cheaper for them to have access to a CAR-T, done to daratumumab and this is the rationale and this is the reason why in china there are so many car teams in the next slide you can see the overall response rate for these 57 patients included in this study 88 percent but 74 percent achieved the complete response and the minimal residual disease negative was negative in 68 percent of the patients so these responses these uh, overall response rate and complete response rate were really very relevant and in fact the responses were maintained regardless of the dose of T cells infused as well as the BCMA expressed on the expression on the surface of the plasma cells. In the next slide you can see the progression free survival. So CAR T's in myeloma are not a curative at least at this moment in which we are including in these studies relapsed and non-refractory myeloma patients. The median progression for survival is 15 months. And in the next slide, we can see here the same progression for survival curve, looking how when the patients achieved minimal residual disease negative, the progression for survival was longer, of approximately two years. In the next slide, the overall survival medium not reached for these patients and uh, when we focus on patients who achieved minimal residual disease negative so at two years 94 percent of the patients remain alive so these results are again encouraging but well we have to evaluate more and more these scar T's, not only in heavily protruded myeloma patients but maybe at earlier stages of the disease in order to see if this strategy can be a potential curative option for myeloma patients. In the next slide, this is the list I previously said, two oral sessions for immunotherapies, including CAR-T and bispecific T-cell engagers, monoclonal antibodies, but well, a long list of abstracts based on CAR-T cells with a clear message 
promising efficacy and safety results, but we need to wait to have a longer follow-up and to have more and more data. And so I stop here and we have at least seven or eight minutes if you want for discussions or questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor, a lot. Uh, are there any questions or comments from uh, from the audience? Uh, please um, indicate, perhaps in the chat box, and then I can unmute you. Or you can also raise your hand uh, by pressing the hand button on your control panel, which will then indicate here that uh, you would like to speak if you have any questions or comments well, it seems that nobody has any questions or comments so i would like to thank you once again uh, for this uh, for this very comprehensive presentation um, which will then be uh, also um, uh, I mean, the recording of this uh, webinar will also be shared uh, with the wider community. And uh, in case you have any subsequent questions or comments to make, then of course you're very welcome to write to us at, uh, at Myelma Patients Europe, especially to Anna Vallejo uh, or even myself. My name is Tamás Beretsky. Um, so once again, thank you very much for the presentation and thank you very much for attending. And with this, I will say goodbye for today and talk to you again soon.